Millions of Soviet kids learned the biographies of these children by heart. The tragic stories of their deaths made thousands of people cry at rallies. Dozens of streets and schools are still named in their honor. The Soviet history has created a cult of the pioneer heroes, but hid the real lives of these children. What is the connection between the pioneer denunciator Pavlik Morozov and the pioneer partisan Vlodya Dubinin? Both boys were icons of their time. But up-to-date research reveals that Pavlik Morozov was neither a hero nor a denunciator. But who were these kids from the official list of Soviet pioneer heroes? And why did their false biographies have such power that influenced the fate of thousands? In Ukraine, the 19th of May is still celebrated as the Pioneer Day. Modern initiations are held under the Lenin Monument in Kiev. These children are candidates. In a moment, they will make an oath and become full pioneers. Their heroes are Vladimir Dubinin, Valya Kotik, Marat Kazai, Lenya Golikov and Zina Portnova. The children partisans who died in World War II. And the most famous pioneer hero in the Soviet Union was Pavlik Morozov. We do not overestimate what people thought of Pavlik Morozov, although we admit that it was a very tragic situation. The kid was struggling between the feeling of a son's love and the duty to the motherland. Following the example of the early pioneers, these children are now taught to be brave, loyal, honest, to love their country, and if necessary, to die for it. But even now, these kids do not know that their idols were fabricated. Zina Portnova and Lenya Golikov weren't pioneers. Kolya Miyagotin did not die the way it was described in his biography. The pioneer hero Grisha Akopian never actually existed. In reality, Pavlik Morozov didn't have to choose between a son's love and civic duty and the partisan Vlodya Dubinin was posthumously attributed the oath that he never took. Watch later. We'll go to Kerch Quarry to see the place where Vladimir Dubinin died. We'll find living witnesses to this event and recreate the real story of the pioneer hero. We'll reveal who Pavlik was in real life, neither a hero nor a traitor but someone completely different. For the first time, we will unravel why their false biographies were so successful. Why did these children's life stories have such an impact at the rallies? Who actually were the pioneer heroes of the Soviet Union? And why did their biographies make thousands of people cry at rallies? Pavlik Morozov and Vladimir Dubinin, the two most famous pioneer heroes of the Soviet Union. The boy denunciator, who allegedly was vengefully killed by native villagers. And the first young partisan, who died in World War II. What is the connection between these boys in real life? In 1949, the Soviet writer Lev Kassil's story, The Street of the Younger Son, about Vlodya Dubinin, was published. This 500-page book taught Soviet children about the story of the pioneer hero. And it brought the two boys together for the first time. In Lev Kassil's story, the Kerch pioneer Vladimir meets Pavlik Morozov's mother and solemnly promises her to be worthy of her son. He's greatly inspired by Pavlik, and in Artek camp, he constructs an airplane model and names it Pavlik Morozov. Along with other pioneers, Vlodia climbs the highest mountain in the camp and launches his plane. A few months later, whilst showing the way to Soviet sappers, 
Vlodia would be blown up by a German mine. He would keep the promise given to Pavlik's mother to die for his country. This is the official version of his life. But what was the real story? We're going to Kerch, the city of Vlodia Dubinin. Nowadays, there's a real cult of the pioneer hero. There is a grave, park, and street named after Vlodia Dubinin. His older sister, Valentina Dubinina, who lives here, explains that a street in Kerch was named after Vlodia immediately after his death. But officials made a mistake. We never lived there. These were our namesakes. Dubinina was a teacher. She had two sons, Valia and a younger one, Vlodia. Officials decided that this was our family. The family of Dubinin the hero lived on Lenin Street. In Arshintsevo, an hour's walk from their house, lies the entrance to the quarry where Vlodia was hiding for several months, along with other partisans. At the school museum named after Vlodia Dubinin, it says, today the quarry is closed. The reason was because it was dangerous. Only black archeologists risk going down there. Among ordinary Kerch people, the galleries have a bad reputation. Anyone who breaks the ban will not come back, lost in the maze forever. The intricate quarry corridors stretch for 43 kilometers underground. Hardly surprising that during the war, the Germans couldn't destroy partisans hiding in these labyrinths. All the defenders of our city went there. Basically, there were 80 partisans and four of these kids. It's risky going down there. We have to move slowly. There is a dark maze of corridors with bats hanging from the ceilings. And on the ground, there are holes called ditches. They were dug and then filled with cans by partisans. When the Germans were entering the galleries, the cans jingled loudly, warning the partisans about the enemy. This is how the quarry looks after the war. Vlodia had seen it much earlier. For the first time, Vlodia went down to the quarry before the war started. He was playing with his friend. But inside, a surprise awaited them. When Vlodia aimed his flashlight on a wall, he froze. His father's name had been carved there. At home, Vlodia learns the family secret. During the First World War, his father was a partisan and hid in these quarries. Vlodia had no idea that a few years later, he would also become a partisan and live in the same quarry. He would repeat his father's destiny. But in his official biography, his role model would not be his father, but Pavlik Morozov. Lev Kassel writes Vlodia's story using evidence from eyewitnesses such as his sister, mother, and surviving partisans. But he had to add an ideological episode to the book. Vlodia was no different from his peers. He used to go to school and play with his friends. He was also keen on constructing airplane models. In the summer of 1941, he received a voucher to our tech camp. And there, along with the other children, he visited Pavlik Morozov's mother. Castle writes that the boy was so inspired by Morozov's son that he gave her a promise to be worthy of his achievements. But Vlodia's sister, Valentina, insists that her brother Vladimir had never met Tatiana Morozova. Only Valentina herself saw Pavlik's mother much later, after Vlodia's death. When Vladimir died, Pavlik Morozov's mother came to us. Now, I don't remember her name or middle name, but she didn't stay for long. She came from the house of the pioneers. 
At the end of her life, Tatiana Morozova lived next to Artek, but she was taken to Alupka and accommodated there in a separate house. She was also compelled to learn the official text about Pavlik's achievement and tell it to pioneers at the closing of their shifts every summer. But Vladimir Dubinin didn't manage to hear the speech. He left Artek before the last campfire. A week after the opening, pioneer leaders were told to send the children home. The war broke out. Why had Lev Kassel fabricated this meeting? And what did Pavlik Morozov's mother conceal in her speech? Nineteen fifty four. All Union Pioneer Organization approves the official list of the pioneer heroes. The Book of Honor of All Union Lenin Pioneer Organization includes Pavlik Morozov, Kolya Myagotin, Grisha Akopian, Vladimir Dubinin, Zina Portnova, Lenya Golikov, and Marat Kazai. The biographies of these children, written by a canon, are almost identical that surely affects the human mind. Exemplary childhood, the struggle with enemies for their ideals, and martyrdom. No deviations from this pattern. Only in the 80s did historians begin to investigate who these children actually were. Pavlik Morozov was considered the greatest pioneer hero in Soviet times, but a traitor in the post-Soviet era. In 1932, in the woods of the Ural village Gerasimovka, they found two children's bodies covered with blood and with red bags on their heads. The commission that arrived at the crime scene discovered that they were Pavlik Morozov and his brother Fyodor. The killers, their cousin and their grandfather were immediately taken to confinement. The evidence was a bloody knife and their clothes. Their motive was revenge for Pavlik's denunciation. Pavlik, as a true pioneer, had given away his father, Kulak, to the authorities. But the bodies were hastily buried and the murder weapon was hurriedly washed. At the court hearing of Pavlik Morozov's case, four people were condemned to death. After just a few weeks, the punitive forces entered Gerasimovka and took revenge for the pioneer's murder. It would take half a century for historians to openly admit that the informer Pavlik was killed by Cheka's officials. They needed an excuse to bring the armed forces into the rebellious village. Gerasimovka wasn't an ordinary village of the Urals. It wasn't inhabited by Russians. In fact, the native village of the pioneer hero was a free settlement of people from Belarus. They came to these lands in search of a better life. With hard work, the people of Gerasimovka founded their farms in the Urals. They didn't want to go to Kolkos. How were the officials able to make villagers give up their property and cattle to Kolkos? They should be intimidated. It was necessary to find them guilty of murder and punish them. But while searching for the reasons of the murder, the historians forgot about the hero. They didn't hesitate to accept the assumption that Pavlik was an informer, a traitor who had betrayed his own father. But why would the 13-year-old pioneer denounce his own father? In the 80s, American researchers collected evidence from living witnesses. Yuri Drozhnikov, an American of Russian origin, wrote down the memories of old residents. They recalled that Pavel Morozov wasn't really a pioneer. The pioneer organization appeared in the village many years later. At the age of 13, Pavel attends an elementary school he can read, but he cannot write. Villagers considered him weak-minded. The teenager could hardly formulate sentences, and the other, more intelligent children often laughed at him. 
How could such a boy have made a denunciation and back it up with communist ideas? Only in the 80s did the old residents reveal the truth about this tragedy to the American researcher. The denunciation was fabricated not by Pavlik, but by his mother to avenge her husband, who left her alone with their children. Pavlik's father left the family when the boy was 12. Pavlik had to work hard to help his mother feed his brothers and sisters. But it wasn't enough. The family was starving. His mother took a desperate step. She invented the denunciation of her unfaithful husband. Tatiana Morozova naively hoped that her husband would be punished and forced to return to his family. She made her son Pavel learn this denunciation by heart. The simple village woman couldn't imagine that her act would cause a terrible tragedy. Her husband didn't return to the family as he was sent to Solovki and was executed. After three months, their son would be brutally murdered and afterwards be made a fighter for ideals, the pioneer Pavlik Morozov, number one in the list of pioneer heroes. After Pavlik Morozov's case, it became the norm. Dozens of children who had been victims of domestic murders, accidents or fictional characters were proclaimed heroes. Number two on the list of pioneer heroes was Kolya Mayagotin. The official version claimed that he was killed in a fistfight. In fact, he wasn't a pioneer and he was killed accidentally. One night, the boy decided to steal a couple of sunflowers from someone's field. He climbed over the fence and was caught by a guard. The guard threatened the thief with a gun. In the darkness, he didn't realize that it was a child. Maya Goten ran away and hid in the sunflowers. The guard shot several times. He only recognized it was the neighbor's boy in the morning when he found his body. His pockets were full of stolen sunflower seeds. Number three on the list of the pioneer organization was a Kopian Grisha. Up-to-date researchers are convinced that the Azerbaijani pioneer hero never actually existed. The Komsomol Central Committee of Azerbaijan had simply fabricated him. At the time, each republic had to propose their hero candidate to enlarge the list. The Azerbaijanis couldn't find such a candidate. Thus, the executive party members made up a boy named Akopian. The list of heroes reveals children and youths who were killed fighting the Nazis. Vlodia Dubinin from Kerch rescued his partisan unit. Valya Kotig from Shepatovka blew up six enemy echelons. Instead of partisans, Vasily Korobko from Chernigov brought German soldiers to the German police. The Germans killed their own people and Vasya happily returned to his unit. After several months, he was fatally wounded in combat. These kids gave their lives for their country. But not all of them were pioneers. When Zina Portnova was tortured by the Nazis, she was only 18 years old. Why were the biographies of these children altered and amalgamated into the list of pioneer heroes? In 1922, the pioneer organization is founded in the Soviet Union. In the beginning, it bears the name of the ancient hero Spartacus. It will take Lenin's name only after his death in 1924. The official history claims that the pioneers were invented by Nadezhda Krupskaya. She wrote the organization's rules and designed the pioneer uniform. In fact, scouts existed in Tsarist Russia since 1909. It was a children's organization founded by Englishman Baden-Powell. These boys and girls played sports, 
went on overnight camping trips and built bonfires. They had their own songs and no political ideology. By 1917, they numbered 50,000. After the revolution, the scout organization split into two branches. The first remains faithful to the principles of Baden-Powell. The other is called Communist Scouts. To differentiate itself, the Communist Scouts changed the color of their tie from green to red. But even this didn't help. After Krupskaya's report about the need for a pioneer organization, both branches were persecuted. At first, scouting was declared a bourgeois and anti-Soviet phenomenon. And then, the scout movement was erased from Soviet Union history. The pioneers announced scout attributes as their own. They used the scout uniform, including a tie with a special clip. They don't even change the scout's call, be prepared, or the reply, always prepared. Even the word pioneer is taken from the scouting practices. There is a great difference between the two organizations. The scouts is a children's movement. They didn't fulfill any government orders. The pioneers exist to serve the party. At first, the authorities have no clear concept about the pioneers. They merely breed horses and dogs for the Red Army and collect scrap metal. But in 1928, collectivization spreads across the country. The authorities dispossess the Kulaks and make them work in Kolkhoz for pennies. They immediately met with resistance. People hide their property in the woods and in cellars and bury their crops so it wouldn't be taken away. But how could the authorities find the hidden goods? The party leaders immediately realize that the pioneers are perfect for gathering information about the rebels. As nobody expects betrayal from children, they don't hide anything from them. The children are simply instructed to watch. Pavlik Morozov was not the first known betrayer. In Ukraine alone, there were five such cases before him, where children betrayed their parents. But Pavlik's case was the first to lead to a mass tragedy, the death of a whole village, and opened a new era in the history of the Soviet country. That same year, they created the legend of Pavlik Morozov. It is carefully constructed from a typical Christian canon. Researchers claim that the story of the pioneer hero is incredibly similar to the traditional hagiographies of the Orthodox saints. A perfect childhood followed by opposition to the infidels and his death as a martyr for his ideals. They even add the biblical parable of the 30 pieces of silver to the legend. The court record stated that Pavlik's grandfather had promised to pay the relatives 30 rubles for the murder of his grandson. The pilgrimage to the grave of martyred Pavlik begins. As a saint, he becomes an exemplary model. The authorities promise a generous reward for those who follow his lead, including a personal watch, an annual subscription to the Pioneer magazine, and for the most diligent denunciators, a trip to the international camp Artek. In 1934, the Central Committee of Komsomol decrees 200 of the best pioneers of the Soviet Union who protected the Kolkhoz harvest and the socialist property will be awarded with a six-week holiday in the all-union camp Artek. A list of children repeated Pavlik Morozov's lead during the famine. Vasya Schmat from Azov, along with local farmers, built a tower in a field. Every day, he climbed to the top and waited until some starving peasant would appear to harvest. These people were called the hairdressers. 
they risked their lives to gather a little grain for their families. The penalty for hairdressing was death. Vasya would lie on hard boards for hours until he spotted a thief. The moment he saw anything, he called the guards. During one summer, Vasya Schmatt's squad arrested and executed four hairdressers. Kolya Vobovoy from Odeskaya shopped a woman from his village. As she walked by the Kolkos barn, where she worked hard for almost no money, she cursed. Kolya reported her. The woman was sent to Solovki and Kolya to the Artek camp. But the most outstanding pioneer was Pronya Kulibin. He betrayed his own mother while she was cutting crops to feed him. In 1934, the year of the famine, these children were sent on holiday to the well-known summer camp in Crimea. They were called the Special Shift. In 1940, on the 15th anniversary of Artek, a rare edition was issued in Moscow. Here is this gorgeous album with historical photos and color drawings of the pioneer camp. There's also a whole section about the special shift of patrol scouts. The children's feats are described, but there's not a single photo of the young Pavliks. It was the only shift without children's laughter. Realizing what they had done, the children fell into a deep depression. Those who had betrayed their families were unusually reserved and aloof. The pioneer leaders didn't know how to deal with these disturbed children. How can one help a child overcome the consequences of its actions? They had nowhere to go and no one to turn to. In their native villages, people hated them. This is the reason the edition shows no pictures of the children. The legend of Pavlik Morozov could never be destroyed. His image was supposed to remain inspiring and heroic. Anyone who deviated from the official version would be harassed. In 1937, they stopped the production of Sergei Eisenstein's film about Pavlik Morozov. The name of the movie was Bezhin Meadow. It was suppressed after a rough cut viewing. Poor direction and bad production values were the official reasons for the closure of the project. The film was shelved and later destroyed during the war. But why? It only became clear in the 1960s when clips from the film were assembled into a video. Here are these unique frames. They made filmmakers realize that Eisenstein had turned Pavlik Morozov into a mythical creature, a werewolf from the biblical myth of Abraham. According to the Old Testament, the Lord decided to test Abraham's faith and ordered him to kill his own son, Isaac. The boy was saved by the creator's divine intervention. In Bezhin Meadow, it's the opposite. The new regime has terminated the old system. The son killed his father. The past is eradicated. A philosophical parable. The peasants destroy churches. Collectivization seems more of a tragedy than a victory of the system. The director was accused of deviation from the party line, was called in for questioning, and forced to write an apology letter and repent in public. As a result, Sergei Eisenstein suffered from nervous exhaustion. A few years later, he died of a heart attack. And Pavlik's story received an unexpected response. In 1937, the pioneer group and the squads were struck down by panic. Masses of pioneers throw off their ties and especially the tie clips. It turns out that the watchful pioneers had found the hidden initials T and Z that represented the enemies of the people, Trotsky and Zinoviev. 
hysteria spreads to the entire union. Party authorities order an investigation. The examination showed that the panic had been started by an ordinary pioneer leader who was simply trying too hard. The supposedly hostile letters were her illusion. No symbols could have been carved into the clip. But the frightened pioneer leader shared her discovery with the children. And her pioneer shift spread the secret meaning of the tie clip all over the Soviet Union. Although investigators found no malicious intent in the case, the clip disappeared from the pioneer tie forever. The guilty were forgiven, but authorities realized that the pioneer ideology must be changed and denunciations brought under control, or the consequences could be unpredictable. Watch later. A tragedy strikes Stalin's family because of denunciation and Pavlik Morozov falls into disgrace. What is the new task of the pioneers? And why can it only be fulfilled at the cost of their lives? The founders of the pioneer movement imitate the scout organization but fiercely persecute Russian scouts. After a decade, the pioneer organization will turn into the most powerful system of overseers and denunciators. Pavlik Morozov becomes the pioneer's idol. Children begin to inform on their parents and relatives. In 1932, in the midst of the trial of Pavlik Morozov's relatives, a tragedy strikes Stalin's family. His second wife, Nadezhda Alilulieva, commits suicide. She couldn't withstand the terror started by her husband. Under the denunciations, Stalin executed old party members, amongst which were many of her close friends. After Ali Luyeva's suicide, her entire family becomes the victim of denunciation. Stalin personally gives the order to repress relatives of his wife. A monument of Pavlik Morozov was erected in Moscow. It was to be placed with honors in Red Square, just in front of the mausoleum. But Stalin suddenly stops this process. The establishment of the monument was postponed for 10 years. Even then, it wasn't placed in Red Square, but in a poor area of Moscow. The presentation took place without much celebration. The press didn't even show up. It was obvious that the general secretary had changed his attitude towards the pioneer hero. In 1940, the stream of children's denunciations suddenly stops. The researchers say that the legend of Pavlik Morozov radically changed within a year. The main priority of the pioneers is no longer denunciation, but a heroic death for the country. The same year in distant Gerasimovka, they found Pavlik Morozov's mother and transported her to Crimea. Tatiana Morozova settles in Alupka, not far from the Artek camp. They arrange meetings with pioneers, but forbid her to talk about her son's feet. They explain to pioneers that this is a heroic mother. She gave her son for the country. Each pioneer must be ready to die, as Pavlik did. At that time, nobody knew that the legend had been fabricated because of the terrible circumstances. Children were prepared to die for their homeland because the country was on the brink of war. Pioneers who came to Artek in early summer of 1941 didn't know that they were to be the last shift. Their fate was to give their lives fighting the enemy and become the new generation of pioneer heroes. The first of these children who died was the Kerch boy Vlodia Dubinin. Vladia's sister, Valentina, recalls that as soon as the war began, her brother, against his mother's will, tried to get into the regular army. 
During the war, our father was taken to the army and was sent to Sevastopol, and Vlodya decided to go there too. He went to the draft board and he was removed from the train. He was just a boy. He was 14 years old, but everybody thought that he was not more than 12. He wasn't skinny, but he was small. Vlodia takes this refusal as a terrible defeat. He must stay at home as a little child while his father is fighting. But shortly after, the boy gets a chance. From his uncle Gritsenko, Vlodia learns that the Kerch people form a partisan unit. His uncle and his son Vanya, Vlodia's childhood friend, join it. And soon the partisans are hiding out in the deep quarries. By hiding in a car full of provisions, Vlodia also joined the unit. He was accepted. This boy knew like no one else did all the entrances and exits of the tunnels. When Vlodia went down to the quarry, he was amazed. On the outside, it looked just the same as it had done five years earlier. But inside, there was a whole underground city with cellars, wells, halls, a hospital, and even a dining room. The partisans had prepared well, as if they knew that they would have to spend months underground. The quarries are surrounded by Germans. They wall up the exits and release poisonous gas. When that fails, they flood the tunnels with water. But each time, the partisans escape the danger. Someone always manages to warn them by reaching the surface, learning the enemy's plans and sneaking back underground unnoticed. Afterwards, the partisans claimed that their unit survived until the liberation of Kerch, only because of the young scouts. But Vlodia's recklessness ended tragically. A few months later, the Soviet troops liberated Kerch. Some of the partisans came up to the surface. Vlodia returned home. But his mother didn't recognize the skinny, unkempt boy. But he was alive. His mother bathes him, but she must let him go again. There are still partisans in the quarries. To save them, the entrances to the tunnels must be mined. Vlodia volunteered to show the sappers the way. On January the 4th, a woman comes to Dubinin's house. She asks the children in the street to tell Vlodia's mother that her son had suffered. Nothing more was said. The mother rushes to the NKVD and was informed that Vlodia had been killed by a mine. He wanted to show the sappers the passage to the central entry and evacuate civilians. They warned him, Vlodya, be careful. He answered, come on, the Germans left droppings and you think they are mines. And he left. The mine detector failed. There was a wire coming from the mine. He stepped on it and was blown up. Vlodia will be solemnly buried along with the other dead in the city's central park. His name will be the first in a sad list of World War II pioneer heroes. After Vlodia Dubinin's death, Lev Kassel started his novel The Street of the Younger Son. This book opened up a new era in pioneers' history. After this, fictionalized biographies of pioneer heroes became very popular. They were written by a canon who corrected anything that didn't fit the official version. Children whose lives didn't correspond to this canon were simply forgotten. Ivan Gritsenko, who rescued partisans with Vlodya Dubinin, wasn't included in any list of heroes because he hadn't died. He survived the war, grew up and got married. His feats in the quarry were forgotten about. 
A decade later, the propaganda will completely erase any difference between Vlodya Dubinin and Pavlik Morozov, conceal the real age of Zina Portnova and Lenya Golikov, who were members of the Komsomol, and make an orphan of Marat Kazai, whose father was arrested and executed. The propaganda will adjust the lives of these children to a well-known Christian canon and turn them into saints who will be worshipped by the whole country for half a century.